So I want to go into a little bit more depth on storage and processing, but before I do, I need you to know about two different concepts. The first is information. We need to talk about how a computer deals with things coming in and coming out. And the smallest amount of information we can deal with is something that only has two states. So maybe it's on or it's off, or it's true or it's false, or it's one or it's zero, or it's a high voltage or low voltage. Uh, these are all things with just two states, and we call those binary, because they're two states. And when we're talking about zeros and ones, as we often do with computers, we call those binary digits. But that's way too long for us to say all the time, so we shorten binary digit to the term bit. And I'm sure you've heard of bits. Uh, a bit is the smallest amount of information we can really talk about. Something is just yes or no, on, off, zero, one. Bits are really small bits of information, though, so we never talk about bits by themselves, really. We talk about bytes sometimes. A byte is eight bits, but that's still not much information. So we have to use big numbers. Here's another thing you need to know about when we're talking about big numbers. What we do, instead of saying a thousand bits, we would say a kilobit. Kilo just means a thousand, so if we put kilo in front of something else, it means a thousand. You guys know what a meter is. You've learned about that in, uh, in school. If you have a thousand of those, we call that a kilometer or kilometer, depending on how you want to pronounce it. Uh, a thousand bits or bytes is still a very small amount, so we might talk about a million of them, and that is a megabit or a megabyte. Often we have to go with much bigger still. We may talk about gigabytes. Gigabytes are a thousand bytes. If we put the term giga in front of anything, it just means a billion of them. The other thing that I want to talk with you about is speed. We talk about speed with computers in terms of how many things it can do every second. And we have a special unit for that. Anything that happens one time a second happens at one hertz. A hertz is just a, a unit that means one time per second. If your heart is beating 60 times a minute, that's one time per second, that's beating at one hertz. If you start exercising and it's beating at 120 times per minute or two times per second, that's two hertz. That's really all a hertz is. It means how many times something happens a second. And you'll find that in all kinds of different fields too. We talk about sound in terms of uh, hertz as well. Uh, so anything that happens periodically, happens over and over again like that, we may measure in hertz. Computer speeds are usually measured these days in gigahertz. How many billion things can it do per second? And computers can do things really fast. So let's talk about storage a little bit. So in the early days, all we really needed was a way to get those individual bits, those zeros and ones or ons and offs, into a computer. And we would literally, in some of the early ones, punch a hole into a piece of paper to say whether that was a zero or a one bit. This is called a punch card. It has a lot of little holes in it. These holes correspond to little bits of data. So if something is either punched or it's not punched, it is super easy to understand. Of course, the downside is that is a very small amount of data. If you wanted to do something with this, you would have a stack of thousands of these. And if you dropped your stack and it went all over the floor, you were in for a really bad day trying to sort those out again. You'll see pictures in a lot of the older computers, ENIAC and Colossus, for example, where they do the same type of thing, but they use a paper tape. And it will have holes punched in a tape that'll be fed through in really fast pulleys. And that's a big improvement on punch cards, but you still get trouble. Uh, occasionally, for example, these uh, paper tapes would be going through so fast that they would catch on fire, which is uh, suboptimal in a computer system. When I came into uh, computers for the first time, we actually used cassette tapes. Much like this one. And you could actually hear, these are really made for audio, but you could actually hear the data making a sound as it went into the computer. It was a big relief when we finally got to the floppy disk. This has a little magnetic wheel inside. I don't know if that's going to come through on the camera. That spins, and you could store a lot more on these. They were super convenient to use. They didn't hold much by today's standards, but uh, they held a lot by the standards of the day. The next big step up was the hard drive, and we're still using these in an awful lot of places. The hard drive looks something like this. There are a couple different formats for it. A little box, but on the inside, 
you have a platter that is, was magnetic and a little arm that would move around. If you've got a record player, that's somewhat like an older mechanical version of a hard drive. And these could hold huge amounts of information. The, the newer ones still can. Uh, now these have uh, frequently have chips. They don't have any moving parts on the inside. Those are called solid state drives. They work generally the same way except uh, without the moving parts. Now it's often common to have chips soldered on the board that you can't remove or change out, but they're really fast and really cheap to make. So that's permanent storage. Let's talk a little bit about temporary storage. Temporary storage, or RAM, may look like this. This is RAM for a laptop computer. Uh, you still find a lot of computers that will use RAM like this. For the Chromebooks, the RAM is usually soldered straight onto the board. It can't be changed or upgraded, uh, but it is really cheap that way. How about the processor? This is the processor of a desktop computer. This one's a little bit older, might be a little bit smaller now, or a lot more powerful. Yours will be soldered onto your Chromebooks, uh, probably, but you'll very seldom see it like this. Usually, when you see a chip inside a computer, it will have a big device on the top. That device is called a heat sink. It might look something like this. And the purpose of this is to suck all the heat out of the chip, and a fan will blow on this and blow that heat away, because heat will kill these chips. These chips do an awful lot. We talked about it doing billions of things per second, and that generates a lot of heat, and heat will kill these things. So you will often have a device called a heat sink sitting on top of the chip. Uh, there's another device that you need to know about that's called the motherboard. Now a motherboard is what holds all of the other pieces together and has all the wiring that lets them communicate. You can think of a mother holding all the other pieces in a big hug. Here's the motherboard for an old desktop computer. You can see where the chip would sit. The chip fits into this slot and clamps down. The heat sink would sit right on top of that chip. The RAM, this will use a different format of RAM, but the RAM fits into these slots here. These slots have little arms that will click when you push it in to let you know that the RAM is latched in and attached. And to disattach it, you just pull those back and the RAM kind of pops up. It also has slots for expansion. So for example, if you're a gamer and you want to play the latest games, you're going to need a special video card that will handle a lot of the graphics. And that video card will fit into one of these kinds of slots. It also has places to put your inputs and outputs. So for example, you guys are familiar with USB. All of your computers will have some form of USB where you can plug in a keyboard or a mouse or something like that. So it's going to have that. Most motherboards will have some type of port for video coming out, although if you want to put a graphics card in there, these will be disabled. Here's an old port we never use anymore for keyboards and mice. Uh, you've got a place to plug in the internet, you've got a place to plug in sound, a microphone or speakers. So it, the motherboard has all of the connections to the outside world. It's got the connections that will hold the permanent memory and the temporary memory and the processor and all of these things together.